You're tuned into Holy Smokes, Cigars, Catholicism, and Conversation. Let my prayer arise in thy sight as incense. I'm your host, Dustin Quick, and this is episode 28. Before I introduce my very special guest and dear friend, uh, I just want to let everybody know that Havana Palace in Windsor, Ontario is the official sponsor of the Holy Smokes podcast. So if you would be so kind, just uh, go to facebook.com slash Havana Palace and give them a like, check their uh, lineup out and their pricing. Caesar and Eli are awesome guys and we like to support local, support small businesses, right? So with that out of the way, I have Mr. Timothy S. Flanders as my esteemed guest this afternoon. Normally, I don't record in the afternoon, so this is a bit of a change of pace. Um, but I have him here with me. Um, so before I let him introduce himself, tell, uh, tell you all a little bit more about him. For those who aren't familiar, I'm just going to read his biography. So Timothy S. Flanders is the author of City of God versus City of Man, the battles that have shaped the church from antiquity to the present, which will be published by TAN this fall, an, introdu an introduction to the Holy Bible for traditional Catholics. In 2019, he founded MeaningofCatholic.com, a lay apostolate dedicated to uniting Catholics against the enemies of Holy Church. He holds a degree in classical languages from Grand Valley State University and has done graduate work with the Catholic University of Ukraine. He lives in the Midwest with his wife and four children. Well, my brother, glory to Jesus Christ. Jesus is king. It's great to see you, brother. Yes, yes, you too. So um, we go back a number of years, actually, and... Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, Tim has taught me the reality and the value of redemptive suffering. Um, there was a time, actually, in which I was tempted to go east and break communion with Rome over the, cel the uh, sort of common celebration of the liturgy. But Tim helped me to see that, look, if things aren't going aesthetically how you would like them, musically, what, what, whatever the case may be, Offer that up to the Lord, and those graces will come to you and maybe to other parishioners that are being fed by things that maybe don't necessarily appeal to you, whether it be him choice or whatever else. And if the homily is a little bit hit and miss, just, you know, ask the Lord to bless Father because he has a difficult job and we don't know the battles that he's fighting. So long story short, this approach has really revolutionized my spiritual life. And it, again, the pearl of great price, redemptive suffering, was the thing that kept me in communion with Rome. And now I'm at a place where I wouldn't leave it for anything, no matter what, no matter what temptations may arise uh, to jump ship the Ark of Salvation. And one of those temptations is actually to go to Eastern Orthodoxy from Catholicism. And we're trying to let Catholics know that that is a deadly mistake. Schism is spiritual suicide. And we want to help you avoid that pitfall and avoid the temptation at all costs. So, Timothy, my brother, um, thank you for being here. Can you please tell my viewers a little bit more about yourself and your journey in brief? Sure. Yeah. I, yeah, I will be brief. Um, Basically, I was baptized as an infant, but I grew up as a Lutheran, evangelical, became Baptist. College, I was a non-denom, if you know what that is. Um, I got really big into Messianic Judaism, just constantly searching for this incoherence, trying to solve this incoherence in Protestantism where the religion was founded 500 years ago, but the real founder was 2,000 years ago. And... Uh, eventually it landed me in Eastern Orthodoxy. So I was Eastern Orthodox for a time as well. That was my final step. And then eventually I realized the incoherence in Eastern Orthodoxy, um, which is a lot more difficult to see. And that's what we'll be discussing today. Um, and then finally I, I came into communion with Rome um, shortly after Pope Francis was elected, in fact. So I, I've my whole Catholic life has been under Pope Francis, and I have never once regretted that for an instant, uh, even though there's many problems and issues arising 
seemingly at a at an accelerating rate nowadays um, in the Roman Catholic Church. I really have never once for an instant regretted that. Um, and so that that's basically my journey in terms of a spiritual um, testimony to grace, of course. Uh, and so that that's that's the basics of where I've been before Rome. Wow, that's a, that's an incredible journey. Uh, yeah. You know, I remember reading uh, an article you had written a number of years ago called An Eastern Orthodox Christian Looks West. And in that article, you sort of picked apart and dismantled a lot of the polemics that Easterners have about the Catholic Church. And you helped us to see kind of the reality. Um, so when you yourself were Orthodox, what were some of the things that you were taught about Catholicism, why Catholicism couldn't be true, or uh, some of these issues? What were, what were the, some of the big ones that uh, you kind of latched onto and held for a while? Well, that's, there's so many different, there's so many different issues. Um, it's hard to even pick one big one. Um, I mean, if, if any of your viewers were our converts, uh, many, uh, the easiest way to explain it, I think, is, is to relate to what Protestants go through. And what Protestants go through is that they are raised with a bunch of misconceptions about Catholicism, even to outright lies that are just completely misrepresenting the, the Catholic faith. And um, it's just, so essentially, as you be, become a convert, you're, you're just have these aha moments over and over. Wow, I didn't, I didn't realize that was actually not true. It's actually mm -hmm. this or that or whatever. And that's essentially what's going on for a, such a large degree among the Orthodox. Um, and, but it is far more deceptive because it is presenting everything against Roman Catholicism by citing numerous saints and numerous fathers, church fathers, going back centuries and centuries to the early days of the church and Council of Nicaea and everything like that. So right. it's citing a, a great deal more authoritative sources than the Protestants can ever do. And so they're constructing this elaborate veneer of the, the one true church, which is a bunch of really Ha really strong half truths. Uh, mm. You know, the Protestants have, they have certain half truths themselves. You know, sure, sure, certainly. You know, but the Orthodox half truths are far more powerful because they can really make the really the best argument. Um, and part of this is because some of their issues actually have not been totally resolved, even in the Roman Catholic Church. There are issues mm -hmm. that just go back even to the beginning. We've never really quite resolved some of these things, right. uh, like the exact nature, for example, just to give an example, the exact ecclesiastical, juridical, moral, spiritual relationship between the infallibility of the Pope and the infallibility of the ecumenical council. That's mm -hmm. just never quite been totally nuanced and resolved completely. That's been a, a traditional struggle in the in the West as well, since going back to the conciliarism in the 1300s. And it was just recently started to try to really resolve that, especially Vatican I and Vatican II, but it's still not quite figured out. And so this is, this is a truth, this is a reality. Mm. And so the Orthodox can actually bring up this reality that it still exists the, in the Catholic Church and then they can draw from that truth. They can add a bunch of errors and sort of generalizations or just inaccuracies to that. And then they can draw upon all these patristic citations. And then they can construct this whole very, very convincing uh, deception, honestly. And now let me let me explain what I mean by deception. Mm -hmm. I'm saying it's it's not it, I would never put anything malicious on any of the Orthodox. But it is a deception, and what I mean by that is it's extremely deceiving. You can look at it, and you can think mm -hmm. that it's true, but it's really not. I think that the deception really just comes from original sin. People just, people just don't really want the Roman Catholic Church to be true, because if it is true, then you have obligations of obedience on your own soul. It would be mm -hmm. much better 
just spiritually on like a kind of a instinctual spiritual level, I would, my, my fallen nature prefers to not be under authority. And so my fallen nature just sort of instinctually creates some sort of way to get out of that. Mm -hmm. uh, not even conscious, you know, it's just my instinct, it's yep. my fallen nature instinct. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I certainly would not. And I, and even I think some, there are orthodox of completely good faith who are really struggling with, you know, overcoming original sin, overcoming and becoming holy, but they still are, you know, making these arguments and some of the, you know, some of it, they're just misinformed or whatever. So it's very complex, but it's, it, it is ultimately deceiving. It's a deception. And so, um, I think, uh, those are the difficulties. So then this is the sort of the context of creating these misconceptions about Catholicism. Um, what I typically tell Catholics is that in general, most Eastern, like if you're going to read it, if you're going to pick a sh pick a, from the shelf an Eastern Orthodox, you go to the bookstore and buy an Eastern Orthodox book. Right. In general, as long as that Eastern Orthodox author is talking about Eastern stuff, they're usually 100% Catholic. They're just talking about the Greek fathers and the Russian fathers and the desert fathers. And, you know, they're just discussing their liturgy and everything like that. 100% Catholic. As soon as they turn West and they start talking about the West, that's when they start to get lost in a bunch of inaccuracies and errors and misconceptions and prejudices and all sorts of things. And so that's what's very, um, that's what's very confusing because the church, especially since Vatican II, has also been trying to restore a great deal of the Greek fathers and the, and the Eastern thought to a much more balanced picture, which is what you see in the new catechism. You see a lot more references to Greek rites, and, and there's a quotation from one of the Eastern rites. Um, and so there is this issue um, where they are creating this very convincing um, veneer of an issue. Um, and that's what's difficult. So this is the type of thing that happens um, when you try to learn about Eastern Orthodoxy is that there's this very, very strong mixture of truth and falsehood. And so if, if you're not, if you end up, haven't spent a great deal of time studying a bunch of, of these sources, it's so easy to be convinced because you don't understand the whole nature of all the different aspects of Orthodoxy. And it's so easy to just get convinced by these polemics, especially like the stuff you get online about orthodoxy. It's very easy to be convinced unless you have all these layers of historical, spiritual study that's taking it on all sorts of angles. It's very difficult to, to not get convinced by this. Of course. So that's the difficulty. And I guess that doesn't really answer your question specifically because we didn't never really talked about a specific answer, but that's kind of the context. Yes. And, and, you just I guess just apply that to every single Catholic dogma, <laughs> and you right. got one for every one. They, you've got one for the Immaculate Conception. They've got one yeah. for infallibility. They've got one for the Filioque. They got one for just go down the line indulgences. I mean, they, it's like every as historically you you can actually trace the the list of so called Latin heresies just grows, and now they would say obviously it's because we invented more heresies, but. Uh, there's a great scholar, Tia Kolbaba, who has a, a, a book called Inventing Latin Heretics. And she, mm. she goes through these, what's called the um, Byzantine lists. And the Byzantine lists were these lists that were coming out in the, in the 1000s, the 1100s and 1200s of the Greeks, where they were just listing things that they thought were heresy in the West. And right. it's quite ridiculous actually if you go through these because they start to say things like the latins are heretics because they wear different hats or have beards or no, or shaven or whatever yeah, they they have different beards and to, and it's very important for people to understand this was not just the latins uh they were condemning everybody else too they they looked to their to their eastern neighbors who were the armenians mm. and there's a quote in a, a greek rubric actually in the pre-Lenten season, which says the actual quote in their service book. So their liturgical book says yeah. this, which is just paraphrasing it. It says that the Armenians begin to fast with eggs or what 
cheese or eggs or something like that, but we fast this way to refute their heresy. So okay. this is the type of <laughs> provincialism that began to consume the Greeks. And to be fair, Latins did the same thing too, but sure. I mean, there's, there's issues, but this is the, but this is the type of thing you still get today. You still have a popular Orthodox priest to this day making a YouTube video and listing all these Byzantine lists. And this is just, this is, this is ludicrous. Honestly, it's so, it's so sad because the, the way that you fast in terms of egg, should you fast with eggs or fast with cheese, according to your standard of, of the tradition, there are different traditions in these, in these non-essential matters and they mm -hmm. should not divide the body of Christ. Amen. Yeah. So let me ask you this. Uh, you often hear the narrative, okay, well, everybody was united until 1054, and then Rome left the Orthodox Church. I mean, what what is the actual historical context of the schism, and when were East and West actually cognizant that communion had broken? I think it was much later than 1054, in fact. It's it's complicated. Uh, basically, the I mean, the, basically, 1054 is not the Great Schism. There's really no date for the Great Schism, so called, um, because it was not. There was no ecumenical council that sort of sealed the deal as terms of a schism or a heresy. There was never an ecumenical council that dated that. There was a growing, uh, the 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 schism between. Well, let me back up for a little bit just for your viewers, there are, mm. at the time of the Protestant Reformation, this is very important, at the time of the Protestant Reformation, the year 1500, there were four different apostolic churches, four. There were three in the East and one in the West. There was not East and West, and this is something that Eastern Orthodox will totally ignore. They won't tell you about this. There's three different Eastern Orthodox churches, three different. Uh, there's the what's called the Eastern Orthodox Church today. There's what, the other group of churches is called the Oriental Orthodox, and then the other group of churches is called the Assyrian Orthodox or the uh, so-called Nestorians. That's a that's a bad term, though. Yeah, um, yeah. And so that's that was the Armenians that I mentioned before. They're the Oriental Orthodox. So, uh, but to answer your question, so the division between East and West in terms of geography had been going on since at least 431, 431 mm -hmm. between all these different Eastern groups that were splitting off with each other and then splitting off of the West. But when we talk about the Great Schism East and West, we're usually talking about one of the Eastern Orthodox groups, which is the, the Byzantines or the Greeks or the Russians, you, you might say, mm -hmm. Eastern Orthodoxy. So that the date that's used is 1054 simply because it's convenient, not because it's true. Um, but the it's I mean, I think the real break comes in 1274 is a big date i think because mm -hmm. that's when there is actually a union that's completely solidified like there was all basically there was all these controversies and people were not sure people were of different opinions are we in schism or not basically mm -hmm. people were of different opinions to, to boil it all this is far more complex than we're able to get into obviously in a show but 1274 is a big date because that's when a union is confirmed but then in actual fact the uh the Pope, in fact, does create the schism at that point because it's a bad Pope who actually allows a bad a bad prince, uh, mm. Charles of Anjou, to convince him to call a false crusade against the East. And so there's a union of 1274. Um, and I'm, I'm blanking on the name of the Pope. I'll, I'll have to look it up. I got a book right here. Um, but he actually calls this false crusade, and that's really when the big break happens because the the Greeks in the East are able to use all of this nonsense that's being done by the Latins, which is wrong, of course. Sure. They're able to use this to provoke everybody against the West and, and solidify a schism, which is really the Council of Lacerne, I think, uh, is uh, 12, what is that, 1290 something? Mm. Uh, but that's when it really gets solidified because that's when, that's when the... the uh, Easterners actually solidify a condemnation that's a, a conciliar condemnation of the Filioque. Okay. And that's when it's a lot more solidified. But even then, even 100, 200 years later, 
there's a Council of Florence, and there's another union, which is far more lasting and far more successful than the first one. And there's still not a clear, totally clear schism. Mm. Um, and so it, it's basically, it's complicated. Um, so let's see, Urban the Fourth. I was just trying to look up the name of that Pope who, who um, called that false crusade, because that's, I mean, if you can blame the Pope for anything, that would be the Pope to actually blame. Right. Yeah, this is, um, Martin the Fourth is the guy we're talking about. Okay. Here, so. Okay. So Martin the Fourth was just a corrupt pope, basically, and and he, because of his intrigues, helped to create the schism as it was. But um, the the Muslims actually bl have a great deal of blame, in fact, in creating the schism. This is another factor that Eastern Orthodox never mention is because the Union of Florence was solidified, and the Catholics were in the East. It was all done. It was a done deal. Mm. There was a great deal of opposition still among the Greeks, but officially formally it was done the union was done in, in the 1430s and 40s at florence but then because there was a lack of a true crusade against the muslims at that time again uh the muslims were able to take constantinople and what did they do they just killed or exiled all the catholics so they imposed and then they imposed their own schismatic patriarch on the constant on constantinople so they really oh, okay. imposed the greek schism they really really created the greek schism if there's anybody really to blame, especially it's the Muslims at that time. And so that's the the big historical footnote that's completely mm. left out of the story. So there's so many different factors. It's essentially extremely complicated. There's political factors, economic factors, spiritual, cultural, theological, all sorts of different factors at play over hundreds of years to create a situation we have today. And obviously both sides are to blame. They're both sides have done atrocities to each other and created this animosity between each other. Um, so trying to make a long, 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 long story short <laughs> as possible. Uh, there's so many different factors. And I, I mean, I would really date the schism to more like Council of Blacarne 1290s okay. as, as more of a formal break. Because even at even after 1054, the Greek emperor still asks for the first crusade to be called. So he still goes back to his, his so-called schismatic people who are schism so-called between them and says, Hey, come help me against the Muslims. So they're still kind of working together and there's still sort of a, uh, work, a working relationship, of course. So yeah, it's complicated. <laughs> so, so, uh, in the 1200s, uh, Eastern Easterners and Westerners were still intercommuning. Um, would you say, well, it's, it would be in certain areas and certain not, I mean, you can count it by different ways. There's basically the, 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 in certain areas you had intercommunion and in certain areas you're not going to have intercommunion. The commemoration of the Pope is what is, you could, that's why people want to say 1054 because the commemoration mm -hmm. of the Pope by the Patriarch of Constantinople was taken off of the liturgy. And so it would seem that they're in schism and he excommunicated the Pope. It would seem they're in schism there, but then later on there's other sources that are saying, are we in schism? We don't even know. Uh, you're not on the, you're not on the liturgy anymore, but uh, you know, there's certainly a schism, a de facto schism happening on a sort of a, uh, a hierarchical level. Um, so you can say that communion broke at 1054, at least for a time, but communion in other areas, was restored the Latin Patriarchate of 1204 to 1274. Um, there's a de facto communion trying to be established. Um, in 1274, the communion is obviously formally reestablished. Um, so it's going to be different in different areas. Um, mm -hmm. But the, the broad communion between the two churches and bishops starting with 1054 is starting to become less and less and especially on a formal level. So because okay. it, it, it ultimately goes down to the local bishop, is your bishop in favor of the schism or not? Is he going to enforce it or not? Is he going to turn away a Catholic who comes to his liturgy or not? And that's, mm -hmm. that's actually what it is today. In fact, um, right. Even to this day, you have a, an individual bishop or priest, and this is what's so, important to people to understand about the Orthodox Church is that there really is no Orthodox Church. There are, there is the Orthodox Churches. 
they have no universal canon law, no universal uh, governance, no universal anything. So even baptisms are going to be different in different Orthodox churches. So there's not really a single uh, way of doing things on a sacramental or jurisdictional level. The Orthodox Church, as such, is currently in formal schism with itself between Moscow right. and Constantinople. So there's mm -hmm. just basically a, there's 14 different Orthodox churches which are been fighting each other for centuries on all sorts of different levels. And so that's the reality of the Orthodox Church. There's no such thing as the Orthodox Church. There's Orthodox churches who are more or less united, depending on which topic you're talking about. Um, but that's the reality, and that's the way it's been since this time. So that's why the, the question is difficult. You can say, you know, Constantinople may be out of communion. Maybe this other bishop was not. Depends on the area. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, yeah, so Alan Roll has uh, has been in the chat, and he's asked me what kind of cigar I'm smoking. Alan, this is a Reposado Estate Blend Maduro Robusto. So uh, just wanted to uh, let you know. Fellow Canadian. Uh, yes, thank you for tuning in. Eric Pine has just joined us. Uh, uh, Masto. So we've got, we've got some people in here. Um, guys, if you have any questions... We will kind of save them towards the end. So just put at Dustin Quick so I can clearly see in the comments which is a question. Uh, I don't want to miss anybody or leave anybody out. Um, and also, let me let me say this. I, I do sincerely, sincerely apologize. I, I seem to be having some connection issues. I, uh, I bought a, a Wi-Fi extender and tried to get it set up as soon as I got home from work, which I had a half an hour, and I just couldn't get it to work. So I do sincerely apologize. Hopefully, uh, it hasn't taken away from the, the quality of what Tim has offered thus far. So please accept my apologies. I will do better next time, by God's grace, uh, get that sorted out. Um, so, you, you know, what I, what I find interesting, so you, oftentimes, Orthodox will tell Catholics, look, we have, our liturgy has not changed. It's timeless. Um, we don't need a pope because we have the census fidelium it's a mystery but we somehow all retain the same faith and we have the same sacraments we're united it's mysterious we don't need this autocrat who sits at the top of a pyramid to direct us to tell us what to do and it's never been that way historically in fact uh easterners have constantly they say rejected such claims to papal authority and it's just not the way of the early church. Um, and examples that you would find, let's say, of, of papal supremacy or primacy, well, that's Byzantine flattery or it's forgeries of some kind. Um, how, would you, how would you respond to that? I mean, when do we first start to see uh, heavy-handed papal authority? I, I have something in the back of my mind that I would maybe put out there, but, but what do you think in terms of like, uh, how early on does Rome start to exercise its authority and have its this self consciousness of being the head of the church? Yeah, that's that's really the question, um, and, which I will preface by simply saying that you made a number of statements at the beginning of your question, which were regarding the Orthodox Church. You said like we're we're, we're united, we all have the same faith, our liturgy was never changed. Most of the things you just said about the Orthodox Church are false. Right. Uh, liturgy did change. You've never, you know, there's tons of unit, there's tons of disunity. There's tons of disunity in the faith among the Orthodox churches. So the, and this is the problem because so many Orthodox, Orthodox Christians, especially in America, don't actually understand the reality of their own church. And mm -hmm. so they have their own, they've, they've been deceived by these polemics basically. And so they're just sort of parroting these things. They don't realize there's, the reality of the situation. Um, so, but to answer your question, um, essentially, there's the, the important thing that people need to understand about these topics is that we have very little evidence of anything about the Catholic faith before 300. We have the New Testament, we have a number of apostolic fathers, and we have Eusebius. 
and we have archaeology and things like that. But mm -hmm. the church was viciously persecuted by the greatest empire in the history of the world for, uh, you know, 300 years or so. Mm -hmm. And so we don't have a lot of documents. We don't have a lot of evidence. After 300, then we have tons of patristic sources at this point. Yeah. So this is why Protestants, some very, very astute Protestants can make arguments to to actually support their own heresies because yeah. there's so little evidence. So this 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 period right here that what we call an anti-Nicene, A-N-T-E, Nicene period has very few historical sources. Now, having said that, then we say, okay, what, what do we do? What do we have? What do we have? Yeah. So we, then we have the letters. So for example, we have the letters of St. Ignatius are our great source, very early source right after the new Testament was written, which he says things like bishops, the real presence of the Eucharist, things mm -hmm. like that, which are fundamental dogmas of the Catholic faith. And then we have, we do have a, a, a number of very important papal statements or actions and you may be thinking of Saint Victor. I think yes, you may. Saint you Vic read my Saint mind. Victor yeah. is the. Um, so there's Saint Victor is a big one. Saint Pope Saint Stephen. These are in the one. And there's um, Saint Clement. Has, Pope Saint Clement has a, an Im implication of papal authority. Um, and these are all in the 100s and 200s. And you have so basically the 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 claim. Now. Okay, keep that in mind. Now, let's go to the dogma of the Trinity. That's mm -hmm. when we get into a bunch of muddy waters because the dogma of the Trinity has a bunch of difficult quotations from this period. So the central dogma of our faith, it's even more central than papal authority. It's more central than papal authority. We have the Nicene of course. Creed. So the Nicene Creed is actually even more important than the papal authority. And we have a bunch of patristic citations from this period, which are actually not entirely Trinitarian per se. Um, St. John Newman says, you know, he would never ascribe any heresy to these. You know, th they're just basically speaking in a way that's terminologically pre-Nicaea. And, and right. this is a whole other conversation. But the point is, we need to be fair about the evidence. So the Orthodox sure. come along, they say, well, look, you only you have these you know tangential statements of Pope Saint Victor you know that's nothing you know that's that's nothing, but then they say well we we absolutely accept the the Council of Nicaea and the Trinity we absolutely accept the the real presence of the Eucharist and all these other doctrines that are all dogmas of the faith, but yeah. as far as this other one it has the same level of evidence, or we more in some eight cases we're going to completely discount that evidence. Well, that's called, that's just being unfair with the evidence. You're not being fair. You're not evaluating this objectively. You come in, you're coming into this with an agenda. You're looking at the mm -hmm. evidence with an agenda. And so this is the type of thing that, that you get. Um, but the evidence is quite early. The, the book that I would recommend is um, this text by Fortescue. Okay. The, the Early Papacy by Adrian Fortescue up to the Synod of Chalcedon 451. And he discusses all of the papal statements up to the date 451. Mm -hmm. And he is the one who also says with Newman, uh, you basically have more Trinitarian problems with the, these fathers than you have with papal problems um, in terms of the evidence. So the evidence is very early. It's, it's in the apostolic, post-apostolic era. It's very early. Um, and it's even, even if you take it a, even more generally than that, and you just say the idea of apostolic authority for bishops in terms of a bishop has a see and he has authority from the apostles, not because he is a certain city, but because he is a successor of the apostles. That concept is even more universal and more established than a particular the see of Rome. And the reason that's important is because the Orthodox are going to start to say, starting in 381, that their bishop is the best because he's the imperial city, not because he has apostolic succession or apostolic authority. It's because the Bishop of Constantinople, that's the imperial city. So the idea that this is the key point for the Orthodox is that their ecclesiology is based on Roman imperial politics. They're saying that their Bishop is the biggest because is the highest or is the highest in the area 
because of the Roman Empire. So in terms of secular politics, so the idea of organizing the church based on secular politics, that is the real innovation. So the real innovation that the Orthodox are trying to justify is actually basing the church on secular politics. And that is that is the, the part that they never tell you uh, because their bishop, uh, the, the, the power of the Pope, you know, they'll, they'll look at the power of the Pope and they'll look at history and they'll say, wow, the power of the Pope just increased and increased and increased, which is true. Right. It's true. It did increase, but it was increasing in reaction to the increased secular power or the power of the Bishop of the secular Imperial capital Constantinople. So the Pope was, you know, in the anti-Nicene period, yes, the Pope had very little power in terms of like a bureaucracy. Yeah, uh, sure. He was exercising universal jurisdiction, but there was no, you know, Curia and Vatican and all the stuff you had today. Right. But as the power of the imperial power continued to increase, and then later you'll see in the West, the secular power of the Western uh, bishops and uh, the kingdoms, as that continues to increase, the, the power continues to increase in reaction by the Pope. And so Vatican I, you know, papal infallibility comes at the at the end or near the end, the third, you know, last quarter of a century of the most massive increase of secular power in the history of the world. And so finally, the papal infallibility is finally reacting to the, mo the, the apex, the climax mm. of secular power. So it's ultimately a power. This is what I, I I try to treat in my book is the is really the power. It's the struggle between the city of God and the city of man. And the, the papal mm. authority is always trying to defend the city of God against the increasing incursions of the city of man. So that's a long winded answer to trying to get at the evidence of, of what you're trying to get at. But um, yes, the evidence is mixed, but we need to be fair about it as well. Sure. Um, and you know, the reason why I think the witness of Pope St. Victor is so powerful at that early stage, we're talking 100s, uh, you know, keeping in mind that Revelation, a lot of people say was written around 100. So we're still in the 100s by this point. Uh, Pope St. Victor um believes himself to have the authority to excommunicate the entire eastern church over the dating of easter to follow the roman dating so i think one has to ask oneself where would rome at such an early period get this consciousness about itself that it has the power to do things of this magnitude. Where did that come from? I mean, like I say, Rev Revelation was written some 80 years before Pope St. Victor. But in so in that short span of time, we have popes speaking like this, thinking that they have the God-given authority, and God-given is a key phrase, to excommunicate an entire se section of the church. And this is in the 100s. So where, where does this uh, self-consciousness come from? It's got to, well, you got two options. It either comes from the Lord Jesus Christ per his commission to Peter, or it comes from the enemy, which means at the very earliest time, since the earliest time, Rome has been in error. But we can't accept that because the, very, the Pope St. Victor, uh, guys who followed him are saints in the Eastern calendar. So that doesn't work. It's got to be a divine institution. You know, people say, oh, it's because uh, Rome was the capital of the empire, and that's why it had the primacy and how it rose to prominence. But if you even look at, like, the Council of Sardica, the reason for the Petrine privileges to be the, the final arbiter of disputes between bishops is due to the memory of St. Peter, right, as it's quoted. So it's nothing to do with... Uh, an outside source of power bequeathing it on Rome. This is something that's a divine institution. Yeah, it's it's quite remarkable, really, that, I mean, the real, the real burden of proof for the Orthodox is to produce citations where the Pope of Rome was actually claiming his authority based on the fact that it was, uh, it was the capital. 
But in fact, it's the opposite. He he was claiming his authority again and again based on Petrain apostolic authority. And it, it seems like the easiest thing in the world to find a quotation like that because it was the capital of the empire until yep. the early 300s. And so why wouldn't the Pope say, well, actually, we're also the head of the church because we're the imperial capital? You don't see that. Say that. But they yeah. don't say that. It's all about Peter, Peter, Peter. It's all about apostolic authority. And this is why the real innovation comes when the the some Greek bishops in the East start to rearrange the church based on the where the imperial capital is. Right. So, you know, Constantinople is now the new Rome and Moscow is the third Rome. This is not something that could be transferred. You know, the reason why the, the keys remain in Rome is because that's where Peter died, right? And I used an example with Elijah Yossi the other day. I said if uh, Peter had had died in Ethiopia, you know, that's where the mother church would be. But because he died in Rome, that's where the, that's where the sea is. Um, and, the, you know, they also say, well, he also was in Antioch, and there's actually three Petrine seas. So who are you to say that Rome is the be-all, end-all when he was in you know, two other locales exercised his authority and taught there. How is Rome any more powerful than the other two seas that he was at? Yeah, that's that's a very good point. And I'll add more to that, too. Um, the idea is that among the fathers, St. Peter is the prince of the apostles. That's the phrase that's used again and again, especially in the Greek liturgy. Prince mm. of the Apostles, Peter. And what we get out of this is the fact that the apostles were bishops. Everybody knows that. The apostles were bishops. So if you say that Peter was the prince of the apostles, you're saying that Christ instituted a prince among bishops. Who's yes. the prince of the bishops? And the idea of Petrine authority has been invoked even in the Persian Empire Church, in the, mm. among the Syriac churches, in the capital of Seleucia Ctesiphon, in the 400s, the bishop of Seleucia Ctesiphon seized power and claimed that he was a, he had a Petrine office. Mm -hmm. And the Constantinople has never been able to claim a Petrine office, but eventually they claimed a an, that they would they were founded by Saint Andrew. Mm -hmm. And this is just basically an invention. They just invented this as a myth. Nobody really thought of that for centuries. And eventually somebody just started claiming that this was St. Andrew's seat. Um, now, I'm not placing judgment on the historicity of that claim. I'm simply saying that somebody's trying to grab for an apostolic authority. Um, but the thing is that Antioch and Alexandria, the other Petrine seas, never claimed primacy according to their Petrine office over the rest of the church. Right. Um, but they did, this is, this is the key to, to the history of the first millennium, is that they did claim authority over Constantinople, in a sense, because Constantinople was asserting authority based on the secular government. Mm -hmm. And now when I say secular government, that's, that's kind of a misnomer. What I mean is the temporal authority. Right. So the temp it's nothing's really secular at this time. It's it's the temporal authority, meaning the government. Uh, it's a Christian government, obviously, but it is the temporal authority. the The emperor is who's deciding this. The emperor is deciding this, not the bishops. Mm. The bishops, and that's that's the that's a key point. Um, but the Antioch and Alexandria are not claiming the same kind of prerogatives uh, as the the bishop of Rome as a successor of Peter. And as you said, Serdica is ascribing this to Rome. Serdica mm -hmm. is a council very early, and they're not trying to ascribe such things to Antioch and Alexandria. So right. if you want to be conciliar and you want to be, uh, you know, taking all the fathers into account, the fathers never had anything compared to Rome in the East in mm -hmm. regarding Alexandria and Antioch. It never existed. So there, there's never really been a claim. So the, mm -hmm. the answer to that objection that you just said was, well, why are you trying to invent something that the fathers never tried to invent? 
you know, that's just not even patristic. You want to be patristic, like you say, well, the fathers look to Rome as the Petrine office. Even if you agree, it was like first among equals. They weren't trying to do that with Alexander and Antioch in the same way. Yeah. Um, another thing is, you know, universal and immediate jurisdiction. That's a that's a big sticking point. So, you know, I remember, I think it was around 2016 or thereabouts, maybe uh, in that time frame. I read the Chieti document. Um, and some, you know, Orthodox got online and said, well, there it is, you're, you're, your commission between Catholics and Orthodox agrees that Rome never in the first millennium exercised canonical authority in the East. Therefore, no, this, this calls into question or outrightly contradicts this, this notion of, um, you know, supreme power, immediate jurisdiction, universal jurisdiction. Now, either that claim in that document that Rome never exercised canonical authority in the East, either that that claim is just outright false or there's a nuance to it uh, that maybe some people didn't pick up on. Is there a way to harmonize that or is this, is this just a false claim, an ahistorical claim? It's, it's really both. And it's not, uh, it's Either just, or. yeah, it, it's very, it is nuanced because mm -hmm. what do you mean by immediate jurisdiction? Are you saying, you know, Vatican one type of bureaucracy of the Curia, or you're appointing bishops everywhere across the world as it is today. No, absolutely not. That, that never existed. That, I mean, it really hasn't existed since Vatican one is really what created that system of appointing bishops throughout the world by the Pope mm -hmm. personally. Mm -hmm. That's really a system of governments governance, which didn't really have any parallel per se. So if that's what we're talking about, yes, if what we're talking about deposing or excommunicating a outside your jurisdiction, you know, judging or deposing the Bishop of Constantinople by the Pope that has happened in the first millennium, that would be immediate jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. uh, there's an event in the Photian schism where the Pope asserts this immediate jurisdiction famously, where he orders a, he, he's, he's, basically seeking to resolve the Fodian controversy and he asserts immediate jurisdiction. Um, the, I mean, you could go back to the council of Ephesus, the council of Ephesus, the Pope gives St. Cyril his immediate jurisdiction. St. Cyril sort of acts as a papal legate in a way yeah. to basically depose and excommunicate if they don't submit to the Pope's judgment. And so, this is all over the first millennium. You just you just need to look at it very objectively. Um, the so these documents for the viewers, these documents that you mentioned, the Chetty document. There's various documents which have been released, which are documents of an un. I mean, it's an official dialogue between uh, the Roman Catholic Church and the fourteen autocephalous Orthodox churches, and these documents are essentially documents of officially blessed theologians and bishops who are making basically theological and historical reflections, which are attempting to resolve the schism. Mm. They have absolutely no authority in terms of a magisterial document or anything like that, or even a synodal agreement. They're trying to work out the schism is what they're trying to do. And so the idea is trying to get into this, this nuance, which is, exactly what I mentioned in the beginning, which is this nuance between the papal infallibility and the ecumenical council infallibility that we haven't even worked out among the, the Catholics, because that is an issue among the Orthodox, which, which is a divisive issue that divides us. So we're trying to work out a, a very difficult issue that we've never even worked out ourselves to on behalf of the Orthodox. Mm. So it's, a delicate thing, um, which has a ton of different nuances and difficulties. Yeah. Um, when I read, you know, when I read some of the acts of the ecumenical councils, I, I read, you know, in Ephesus, how the legate spoke uh, in the person of uh, the Pope with regards to the Roman See and the th authority that she had. Um, and that's early. That's, you know, 431. And you, you could see, you could clearly see Vatican I language. 
Um, you see Vatican I language in the Council of Chalcedon. Um, it's just, it's all over the place, but you actually just, you have to go in and actually read the sources. I think if I'm not mistaken in, in Chalcedon, there is a section in which I remember reading this before, correct me if I'm wrong, but, uh, the legate says in the, you know, on behalf of Pope Leo, that Pope Leo, St. Peter gives the ecumenical council, the authority to ex excommunicate Dioscorus. So I, I found that quite interesting because you often hear that a, from certain orthodox that a pope is subservient to an ecumenical council or you know he doesn't have any authority as its adjudicator as its as its final arbiter where the buck stops but i found that language particularly interesting that the that saint peter gives the council fathers uh the authority to excommunicate Dioscorus. I hadn't read that in some time. Um, does that ring any bells for you? Yeah, I, I'm not familiar with that particular quotation, but I'll, I'll give you another one from that council, and that is the infamous Kenneth 28, which is approved by the council. So the ecumenical council approves a, a given canon and then sends it to Pope Leo. And then Leo says this, quote, the agreements of the bishops, which are contrary to the holy canons of Nicaea, we declare null and void, and by the authority of the blessed apostle Peter, we annul them completely by a general decree. So that is the Pope, St. Leo, who's a saint in the Orthodox Church, annulling an act, a solemn act, of an ecumenical council. Right, right. So you have an Orthodox saint, that, I mean, that is Vatican I right there. Uh, you have an mm -hmm. Orthodox saint annulling the acts of an ecumenical council. So that's that's right. the problem with the Orthodox is that they their own saints preach various things like this. So the difficulty is that there there's the Petrine office of the Roman See, but there's also the Petrine office of every bishop. Every single mm -hmm. bishop is, in a sense, in another sense, Peter. He's Peter to his priests. And mm -hmm. so his priests form sort of the apostolic college. And so there is a Petrine office in that sense as well. And so it's always a balancing act in the history of the church is balancing these two Petrine offices, the Pope and every other bishop. Because as, as I mentioned before with Pope Martin, you know, not all the popes are great popes. Many mm -hmm. popes are bad popes. They need other bishops to try to exhort them to do right and, and whatnot. So it is, this is what creates the nuance is mm -hmm. that there is the infallibility of the Pope, but there's also the infallibility of the ecumenical council. And there's also the infallibility of, you know, the consensus of the fathers. There's the infallibility of all Catholics throughout time, the tradition, uh, mm -hmm. you know, there's all these other sources of infallibility that are always balancing each other. And in the history of the church, you have different differing, areas of infallibility sort of shining, if you will, you know, in a particular case, you know, if you yeah. have a really bad Pope who wasn't doing his job, you know, the conciliar controversy is the big one in the West where you had three Popes, you know, what, what do you do with papal infallibility when you have three Popes? <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, you have an ecumenical council to try to resolve it. And that's exactly what they did. And so the, the Orthodox look at this to say, see, see, yeah. well, that's because there is this balance between these different organs of infallibility that Christ gave to his church so that even when sort of one is obscured or, or, or some difficulty arises with one yeah. then another arises to cover that, you know, and this is ultimately it's charity because the, as St. Paul says, how can the eye say to the foot, I have no need mm -hmm. of you. And that's kind of, what the Orthodox are doing is they're saying, well, we have the ecumenical council in theory, so we have no need of you primacy. And, uh, but ultimately it is a, it is a both and it's an interdependency where we work together mm -hmm. in charity and we overcome the issues in the church. And that's what we need most of all is charity among, among these Orthodox and Catholics. Yes. Uh, amen. So uh, you brought up some really great points and I'm glad you did. I, I mean, I think some Catholics might even be under the impression that our ecclesiology is like, it's just top down and that's it. But 
we can say with the Orthodox, and maybe Orthodox aren't even aware of this, we don't contest, as you just mentioned, that each bishop is Peter in a sense. The Patrine office is at the local level, it's at the regional level, and at the universal level. It's multivalent, multi-layered, and it's, it's, uh, it's not mutually exclusive. And I like how you said that infallibility is one thing. It really is one thing. And ecumenical councils and, you know, papal statements, these are not to be broken up into different things as if they're, as if the subjects that they're focusing on, i.e. the faith, are, are different or divergent. These are instruments of a single thing, which is the infallible faith. And at certain points, one may be exercised or outshine another, right? That's a very good, uh, very good analysis, and it, it's it's very balanced. So basically, what the Orthodox have in terms of ecclesiology, that's Catholic. We hold that, but they're simply missing the universal Petrine privilege. So we have what they have plus what Christ has desired in terms of that. Yeah, insofar as the Orthodox are not preaching any sort of anti-Western doctrine. Like I said, right, if they're just right. being if they're just being Greek qua Greek, uh, according to the Greek fathers and everything like that, that's entirely Catholic. But as soon as they start to look west and start to condemn stuff, that's when they go off the rails. Um, but like you mm. said, that's that's and that's an important thing for people who may be tempted to go Orthodox. Everything that's beautiful and good and true about the East is already present in the Catholic Church in the Eastern Catholic churches, and so. Mm. You know, many people, I mean, especially this is an important aspect of this, is that people, a lot of times, I know many personally, who just encounter Eastern spirituality or Eastern liturgy or Eastern anything that's Catholic, Eastern Catholic, anything. And they just have a sort of a, a spiritual awakening where something really clicks for them with the Eastern thought or spirituality that really helps their spiritual life. And so they're drawn mm -hmm. to the Eastern rite. And that's t that's fine. That's sure. that's happened throughout history. People have moved in different locations and found different pathways to holiness. And mm -hmm. so, yes, it, even on the ecclesiological level, if the Orthodox Church are simply saying they're simply emphasizing collegiality, emphasizing uh, things like that, that is something that Vatican II was attempting to recover with mm -hmm. the concept of a collegi of collegiality. Vatican II, at its best, is trying to reunite with the with the east is trying to mm -hmm. restore a lot of eastern things that have been lost for various reasons especially as a means to restore this unity be, between us and so many of our apostolic brethren in the mm. greek schism you know this is a, an important fact to keep in mind too a lot of people isolate vatican one and say look at the ecclesiology because you have pastor eternus and and that's the be all end all but <clears throat> what we need to bear in mind is that uh, the Franco-Prussian War disrupted Vatican I and they had to call off the council. So what ended up getting on the table in, in, in the form of Pastor Eternus was one sort of decree of ecclesiology. There were other drafts, other documents that actually, from what I've heard, emphasized the collegiality to... to complement the primacy and supremacy of the Pope, but because the council was disbanded, they couldn't do that. And so what it, what ended up happening was those other documents came in the form of like papal encyclicals subsequent to Vatican I. And ultimately what Vatican II does is it doesn't it doesn't shift from Vatican I, but what was intended at Vatican I in toto is encapsulated in, in Vatican II in Lumen Gentium, for example. Vatican II formally closed Vatican I. So that's what people need to keep in mind. Yeah, but Orthodox, Orthodox brethren, Vatican I was not about the East. Mm. It was about attempting to react to things like the French Revolution, the state power that was absolutely tyrannically supreme to the point of murdering countless priests and nuns and 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 faithful hmm. that type of which ultimately we see in in the first world war and the second world war 
that's the type of thing that Vatican I was trying to react to, especially with Pastor Nateranus, was trying to confirm the infallibility of the faith. Is that exactly what you just said? The infallibility mm. of the faith, because in the 19th century, the faith and the church were completely called into question on every single level. And Pastor Eternus is trying to confirm the infallibility of the church. That's mm -hmm. the that's the goal of Pastor Eternus. They focused everything on the Pope for various reasons. But like you said, because of these historical situations of God's providence, the council was not able to get to further nuances and further aspects of infallibility from other sources of infallibility, like the bishops and that type of thing. Mm. Yeah, and so, you know, when when Orthodox are dialoguing with us and they'll say, well, I just can't accept Vatican I. Well, I would say, and I'm sure you would agree, that the buck doesn't stop with Vatican I. Read Vatican I and Vatican II, which formally closes it. Consider the historical context and the, you know, the, the surrounding factors of Vatican I. And because it that's not the complete picture. It wasn't intended to be. It, it was just one decree on papal infallibility. But it was highlighting that, that, that one instrument of the Pope being infallible in certain circumstances, limited circumstances. But that doesn't mean there aren't other organs of infallibility you just don't see that at Vatican I because of the war. They couldn't go on. It's that simple. Yeah, uh, absolutely. There's, there's a great deal that we can concede to the Orthodox. Mm -hmm. What we can concede in particular, I mean, the Orthodox are, at best, they're concerned about the integrity of the local bishop's authority. Mm -hmm. They are concerned, and, and with good reason. And what we can concede is the, the evil of Latinizations, which have been imposed on the Eastern Catholic churches through various means, which is a, a suppression from on high against apostolic customs and liturgies and things of this nature. Mm -hmm. this, this comes to a dramatic ugly climax actually with Pius X, who is a great saint of the church. But in this particular case, unfortunately, he had bad advisors in the Vatican when he suppressed uh, married priests in, in the mm. United States among the Eastern Catholics with the document Ea Semper. And this mm. became a provocation of the Orthodox, say thousands of Eastern Catholics. I don't know what the actual numbers are, but Eastern Catholics were departing from the mystical body of Christ and joining the Orthodox schism on this issue. And it's because it was actually a wrong decision on Pius X's part. The Ruthenian yeah. bishop, the Catholic Ruthenian bishop, had to fight Pius X or fight the Vatican to actually get his own jurisdiction to, to, to actually care for his own faithful at that time. Mm. And that was because there was uh, an overextension of papal power there was a, 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 an erroneous decision, which actually was not reversed until Pope Francis. Pope Francis actually reversed this wrong decision. This is the irony. You know, people hate Pope, people hate Pope Francis and love Pius X. But in this particular case, there is a reversal of, of so, you know, so-called errors. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. this is the type of thing that the Orthodox are rightly concerned about. And so we can, con we can concede a great deal and say, yes, Pope's, bishops or, or various factors like, you know, imperial powers like the Portuguese have imposed some sort of some form of Latinization to mm -hmm. suppress apostolic customs or liturgies or various things like that among the East. And this right. has been a problem for centuries. And Vatican II actually was one of the, the best things about Vatican II is that it it very firmly repudiated the leg the evil legacy of Latinizations. That's one of the best things, that, in my opinion, that came out of Vatican II is a repudiation of that very forcefully, more than ever before. The popes had condemned it before, but... Um, so this is a very important concern, and, mm -hmm. and we need to communicate to Orthodox that this is a, this is a, a, a reasonable concern and, but this is ultimately it falls back on charity because, you know, the as we concede, the popes have made 
errors of the prudential character. You know, they have never made errors of, of the faith and morals, you know, universal papal doctrine character. But popes are not impeccable. They do make errors. They make they commit sins, and there's not always uh, justification for what they do. Sometimes it is wrong, and it gets reversed. But this is the this is the messiness that comes with working your salvation out through fear and trembling through charity through truth and charity it's it's the 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 difficulties of being in a church with humans and you're mm -hmm. going to get the same problem in the orthodox church because you're going to get the holy synod in antioch or the holy synod in the patriarch or whatever because they have the exact same problem with the old calendar controversy uh their, mm -hmm. their the patriarch of constantinople made a unilateral decision to impose a different calendar, which has provoked a schism ever since among the Orthodox. So they have the exact same problem, except it's on a lo more localized level. And so you don't you yeah. don't really escape the problem of bad bishops or bad decisions from on high. You don't escape that by becoming Orthodox. And that's an important point. But we need to concede, of course, injustice, that there is, there is a legacy of, of, of overreach you know, we, we don't really want the Pope to have to appoint bishops across the world. That's that's kind of an, you know, anti-subsidiarity uh, mm -hmm. situation. You know, we, we don't really want that per se. We would prefer like a local, uh, a local, not maybe not election, but at least a more local process. Yeah. But this is the situation we're in for good or for bad. Maybe it is a good pro thing to do right now, or maybe it's not. It, it's just... These things do develop to a degree on a on a historical level, but not in their mm. substance. And there is, you know, even today I see, uh, you know, some some Orthodox and Eastern Catholics even they uh, they see Eastern Catholicism as a stepping stone to Orthodoxy. So, for example, if you have a you know a Orthodox convert, let's say, and a friend tells him, "Oh, I'm becoming Eastern Catholic." The Orthodox will rub his hands with glee and say, it's only a matter of time before you make the full immersion. So they see it as like a stepping stone. And then you get the sense among some Eastern Catholics, they, they say things like, well, really, I only accept the first seven ecumenical councils. Uh, and they, they cite Paul VI for some reason on this. Uh, and then they say, oh, everything after... The seventh council is, is basically a Western council. The Eastern bishops were there, so it's not ecumenical. And I can just kind of dispense with all of that. And I can be Eastern Orthodox in communion with Rome and adhere to the first seven ecumenical councils. Is that is that wrongheaded? Like, what what are we to make of that? Or how should we advise somebody who's who's thinking of taking that view? Yes, it's wrongheaded. Uh, it's heretical, in fact. I'll go mm. further. Um, no Catholic can deny the Immaculate Conception. It's dogma. Eastern Catholic, Western, North, South, East, West. It's a dogma. And there, these, I mean, in my experience, I don't know a ton of Eastern Catholics, but from the ones I know and the ones I've interacted with, there seems to be, in general, two general parties on this question. There's the Orthodox and Communion with Rome party, mm -hmm. who followed uh, the Bishop Elialis Zogby. Yes. Of, uh, uh, I can't remember if he was Melkite of Antioch. I, 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 there's three or four different patriarchs of Antioch. So I don't recall which one he was, but um, so Zogby, so that's the Orthodox in communion with Rome idea. Uh, meaning, like you said, you, we don't have mm -hmm. to accept the ninth, 10th, 11th ecumenical councils or whatever. Um, you know, we can question these things. And then there's the Eastern Catholics who are um, really fully Catholic. They're, they don't have one foot in orthodoxy. They're, you mm -hmm. know, the Eastern Catholic history is very heroic because the Eastern Catholics shed their blood rather than forsake communion with Rome in this uh, against the Soviet Empire. Right. And in various others, uh, even before that, centuries before that, they were they were they were actually facing persecution from their eastern brethren and the west as we just said you know they were facing these latinizations on the one hand and they were facing bloodshed on the other hand from the eastern so the eastern catholics have been very heroic 
And that is mm. the legacy that Eastern Catholics need to draw upon. Wow. When they're when they're discussing these things, they it's really a cross even today. Even today Eastern Catholics are treated as second class citizens in the Roman Catholic Church in various circles or various areas. And that's that's an injustice. That's a great injustice and it's a provocation for the Eastern Orthodox, of course. Yeah. And but that's a cross that they carry heroically because they believe in they believe in the Petrine office. They believe in the church. They believe in charity. They believe in, like you said, redemptive suffering. They're willing to take up their cross and die as martyrs like St. Joseph at mm -hmm. the great Eastern Catholic saint. And they're willing to do so because they believe in the dogma of no salvation outside the church, because that's ultimately a dogma about charity. They're saying, I will not break with my brethren. My brethren, abuse me, mm -hmm. I will with them even if my brethren i will not break with my father even if my father abuses me that's charity that's a cross yeah. that's a great great cross and it's a great glory for these eastern catholics so that's the real legacy of eastern catholicism and then you get today you get this orthodox in communion with rome idea which is where i mean to i'm sure to a large degree these are you know eastern catholics who are in a, a tiny minority Mm -hmm. within a bigger minority in a Muslim country. You know, that's the type of problem that they're dealing with. And especially in places where there's a strong Christian minority, like places like Egypt, there's obviously a great camaraderie among the, the all Christians, even Protestants, because they're living in a Muslim country. It makes sense. Yeah. Uh, and there's a great desire to get those bridges built so that we can work together in a Muslim society uh, but it can sometimes go too far, and that's when that's when you get the Orthodox communion with Rome idea. Mm, I see. So uh, let me ask you this: when we uh, when we look at the Council of Florence, uh, and you say, "Look, you know, uh, papal claims were conceded, purgatory, uh, the filioque, in a from the Father through the Son type of deal, but still it was it was assented to by the the Eastern attendees, the bishops, the clergy, and then of course the clergy get back home, the laity revolt, and the you know the the Florence is out the window. So I like to say to people, look, the laity for various reasons didn't want the reunion, which is understandable given the climate and everything. The fact is the clergy agreed to the terms of union, agreed to the theology presented. So that right there is a powerful statement, I think. But then they'll respond by saying the only reason the Eastern clergy assented was because they needed outside help against you know, Muslims. So they said, Rome, we need your help, and we're, we're willing to accept whatever you say just so you can help us. So really, it's they, they didn't accept it on the basis of religious truth. It was more external pressure. Is that really true? Well, it it is true, and it's not true. Uh, like, every, like we've been talking about, there's so many half-truths. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you're going to be consistent about negating an ecumenical council based on pressure from an emperor, then you should negate the fifth ecumenical council, which was enforced by Justinian's army. And so if you accept that council, uh, you know, emperor's army that was just hunting down everyone who opposed him and deposing bishops who didn't oppose the council, well, you're going to have to check a lot of other ecumenical councils that had political pressure of some kind. So political pressure happens in history. And so you may be motivated by a less than pious motivation, which ca may cause you to relook at something that you wouldn't have otherwise looked at. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so, yes, there's political pressures that, on all sorts of different areas and aspects of that. So just because there's political pressures, there are political pressures at pretty much every ecumenical council. Oh, yeah, <laughs> so, of course. I mean, there's all sorts of historical <laughs> problems with uh, that. Uh, so the problem with that claim mm. is that in particular, there is a, a dearth of historical sources, again, because the Muslims took over and they killed all the Catholics because they didn't want the Union of Florence. It makes obvious sense to them. You know, of mm -hmm. course, they're going to do that. Of course, they're going to destroy any historical record of that. Of course, they're going to rewrite the history as much as possible. They're going to, you know, th this is 
so much of this history is actually created by Muslims. That's an important mm. point. This is um, uh, this is the text written by an Antiochian Orthodox Christian. So this is Eastern Orthodox right here. Muhammad mm. II imposes the Orthodox schism. That's uh, a number name me. That's an Orthodox author. Yeah, this is an Orthodox author claiming this. Wow. But this wow. is this is the type of thing. This is an example of the difference between Antiochian Orthodox and the Greek Orthodox. There's a strong difference between those two because mm. uh, we don't have time to get into all that stuff. But Antiochians are essentially far more uh, willing to work with Rome than the Greeks are or the Russians. Mm. And there's various reasons for that. But sure, sure. Um, it's, it's undeniable that the Muslims imposed at least a great deal of the schism. Uh, we can even concede that the you know, Florence was a, not a success or whatever, but obviously the Muslims took over and they imposed their own patriarch on Constantinople. Obviously, that's a historical fact. So there's all this. There's there is a strong factor there. I'm not saying the Muslims just totally invented. There yeah, was, sure. There was lay opposition. There was Mark of Ephesus, a bishop, and other bishops or monks who were opposing the union. Yes, there was. It was there was some popular support against. Florence, but we also mm -hmm. know that Florence was accepted by uh, various Eastern bishops, mm -hmm. as you said, um, which became comes the basis of most most of the Eastern Catholic churches to this day, minus two. Uh, they all accepted Florence as the basis of union uh, with various additions and, and various things like that. So mm -hmm. I still count Florence really as a successful council. People, people malign it as, as a, uh, a failure to this day, mm -hmm. which I think is, is basically when you say Florence is a failure, you're basically saying all the Eastern Catholics are a failure. Um, mm -hmm. I was just going to look up the total number of, I'll get this in a second, but the, um, the total number of Eastern Catholics is in the millions. It's not just a, you know, a family of 12. Right. This, this is a little bit more than that. And as I said, there's this great history of martyrdom and suffering. Um, 13,209 and 516 is the current count according to uh, Roberson in 2008. 13 mm. million. Wow. So this is not obviously 13 million compared to 1 billion Christians is a very tiny number, but 13 million people and souls is mm -hmm. a million. I mean, it's 13 yeah. million. So, yeah. Uh, well, we're, we're nearing the end of our show, I think, but let me ask you two quick questions sort of as a closing. Number one, is it true that Photius uh, died in full communion with Rome and did he, did he accept Petrine supremacy? Uh, I'm, I have not studied that particular controversy in a long time, so I, I hate to answer definitively on that. But I do believe that he did. He did first to answer your first question. I do believe that he did die in full communion with Rome, mm -hmm. and there is Petrine primacy was accepted at. I can't remember if it was the eight sixty nine or the eight seventy nine, but there was um, some acknowledgement of Petrine primacy. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously. The Pope was completely involved from the very beginning of that coal controversy. Um, but there were things that were left unresolved. So did, did Photius accept papal primacy? Yes, to a degree, at least. Um, but there is there are limits to what I think we could claim about what Photius accepted regarding uh, Petrine primacy. Okay. Well, I, uh, let's do a quick question from uh, Alan, and then we'll, I'll do my closing question for you, and then we'll get out of here. Um, so he says, question for Timothy. What do you think of Sachensky's book on the papacy? Oh, Sachensky. Yeah, you know, see, this is the thing. I, I'm not as current on the scholarship as I, I could be because this is the stuff that I studied uh, since 2010, 12, when I really – examine this further i have not actually looked at his book on the papacy i did study his book on the filioque mm. which seems to be quite good um in terms of just a scholarship so it's very good i'm assuming his papacy book is also good um he seems to be a good scholar um, but ultimately the orthodox scholars like mayendorf for example i think mayendorf is one of the best of course mm -hmm. um 
they are willing, the best Orthodox scholars are willing to ex concede a lot. I mean, th this is the thing you need to, you know, just ignore the Orthodox polemics on the internet. Just ignore it. Don't even go there. Mm -hmm, Read mm -hmm. people like Shiansky or Meyendorf or people like who are serious scholars. Mm -hmm. They're willing to concede quite a bit. So I can't really comment on his papacy book because I haven't studied it in depth, but um, I know his filioque book is is a good contribution to the debate. Mm -hmm. And that's what Alan just said. He said the filioque book is the better of the is two, in his opinion. Um, OK, so here's the million dollar question. Let's bring it down to a practical level. So you've got a Catholic, right? The Catholic is sort of enchanted by Eastern Orthodoxy and their arguments. And they say, look, I know communion with Rome is important, but the parish or parishes that are within my uh, purview, they don't provide what I need. Uh, there's no, I mean, everyone's different. I, I don't want to just say this is the standard, you know, look of every Catholic, but this is what I hear sometimes. Okay, so I've got no no liturgies, Catholic liturgies in my area that I feel fed by. The only thing that's in my area that I could get the sacraments from is an Eastern Orthodox Church. I have no other options. So based on that alone, is this a case of spiritual emergency where I'm basically let off the hook and I could join the Orthodox Church or do I do I offer this up? Do I go to these masses? Do I go to these liturgies that are not as beautiful as the Eastern one? And do I remain in communion and offer up my suffering for the salvation of the world? What what is the appropriate response? Well, the appropriate response is obviously to remain in communion and offer up the cross and be willing to shed your blood rather than to die outside communion with Rome. Because the bottom line is that if you leave communion with Rome, you're going to hell. Let me say that again. If you leave communion with Rome, you're going to hell because there's no salvation outside the church. Now, I'm not going to deal with a bunch of nuances and all sorts of things about salvation outside the canonical boundaries of the Roman Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's just set that aside for a second. But when someone knowingly, and this is, I'm going to, I can just quote Vatican II for this. In fact. Yeah, Lumagentium, right? Yeah. Vatican II says, he who would know that the church is necessary for salvation and would not join it, and I'm paraphrasing, that's not exactly what it says, but it's something uh -huh. to that effect, cannot be saved. So and yeah. the reason for that is because it's charity. The definition of mortal sin is the destruction of charity in the soul. That's what mortal sin is. Mortal sin destroys charity between God, you, your soul, and God, and your, your, your neighbor. Right. This is what mortal sin is. And so when you leave communion, you're saying no to charity. Mm -hmm. that's, what, that's why that's a mortal sin. That's why you'll go to hell. It's a dogma of the faith that people in mortal sin go to hell. That's a right. dogma of the faith. Nobody can disagree with that. And when you break charity, when you choose schism, you're going to hell. Unless God miraculously saves you for some reason, uh, mm -hmm. for some extra gr extraordinary grace or something like that. But ordinarily, you're going to hell. So that's the bottom line is, do you want to go to hell or not? And right. so <laughs> that's, I mean, you, you just got to wake up and smell the sulfur. And that's that's the thing that really helps put these things in mind. And that's why so many Eastern Catholic martyrs have said, no, we're not going to join this faux Orthodox church that the Soviets vented and whatnot. Okay. So start there. Mm. That's, that's where you would, you should start, start with the fires of hell. That's a very helpful thing always. Uh, now, except for scrupulous souls, I'm not except, but mm. for this particular situation, that's what I usually bring up. Um, but now, if we start with the dogma of no salvation outside the church, mm -hmm. and then we we look at the situation. Now, mm. what you're describing is a very real and spiritually and emotionally wounding situation that many Catholics are under because we are living in the era of the new iconoclasm. And the new iconoclasm is just as insidious and evil as the first iconoclasm back in the 700s you know it, it, back then they were actually killing people and hunting them down and killing them so mm. it's a little bit less bloody but 
it's uh, very insidious and difficult because there are enormous liturgical abuses in which priests of God are abusing our Lord and the Blessed Sacrament in the Roman Rite to this day across the world. And this is a, a grave offense against Almighty God, uh, a, which will provoke his great wrath against us. So we're in this situation of, of great crisis and, and darkness, and we need to realize that, and but also realize that the church has faced many, many different periods of darkness before. Hmm. And this is the subject of my, my new book, is, is all these different periods of darkness and crises, and the church has gone through them because men of God fought manfully with the power of the cross. They were willing to lay down their lives and suffer and that's always the answer to mm. every single crisis of the church is to suffer, mm -hmm. to love suffering, love the cross, to love this because it detaches us from this, this earthly world. The, the post-communion prayer for Feast of the Sacred Heart, which is the post-communion prayer that we despise earth and cling to what is heavenly. Mm -hmm. And that is ultimately one of the great spiritual benefits of suffering is that it detaches us from this earthly suffering world that is, is mm. dying away, that God is redeeming through the individual work of each saint. So these are the spiritual things that one needs to keep in mind. Now, it becomes extremely difficult when you have a wife and children. So it's one thing when you're single, you know, mm -hmm. I you've told suffer. me this before. Yeah, yeah, I could just suffer through any liturgy. It's no big deal type of thing, you know. But when I have my children and they're watching a liturgical abuse happen and they're watching someone desecrate the holy sacrament, the holiest of holies that I'm trying to inculcate the real presence of Christ, the faith of the real mm -hmm. presence in my children, who's, you know, my little tender children who are innocent. They, they, they don't have a form of faith. They're forming it. You know, that's something that can be very destructive to the faith of children. And so this becomes very grave in that situation. So mm -hmm. I can't make a universal uh, judgment for every situation about what you need to do to deal with that situation. Mm -hmm. um, and so the universal things that I can say are don't leave the church, don't forsake communion and join the Orthodox Church. However, there are certain circumstances, especially when you're in danger of death, for right. example, <laughs> where right, right. you can actually receive sacraments from an Orthodox priest, according to canon law, current canon law, because of emergency situations, like you said. Now, mm -hmm. is that an emergency situation or not? Are you in an emergency situation? If you're not dying, generally, no. Mm -hmm. uh, you're not in an emergency situation. Now, there could be other factors, however, for a particular situation that may be different, that cha may change your situation and whatnot. Um, ultimately, many of us need to move, actually. This is this is ultimately the long term solution. You know, if you are if someone in your family is in danger of death or whatever, and you need to seek an Orthodox priest or whatever, something like that crazy situation. Ultimately, the long term solution is to either change your Paris situation or move. And that's that's unfortunately the the problem. Sometimes it's actually easier to move mm -hmm. because changing your Paris situation is extremely difficult and you're going to put your children through five years of battles with the parish council you know maybe you're in a situation like that you know hmm. it's it, it just depends it just depends on the situation you know maybe maybe you are in a uh, uh situation where it's just kind of bad and it's tolerable and it's not mm -hmm. gonna hurt my kids you know mm -hmm. that's something that would be a great situation of showing your children the redemptive suffering to suffer through a situation, try to make it better, work through that. You know, children are still remarkably resilient, even sure. though they are vulnerable. They mm -hmm. have a great resilience to them, which is God created in them because children face a lot of difficulties. Mm -hmm. So it really depends on the situation. Um, but I think, I mean, there's a lot of, there, I hear of people who are in situations. It depends. I think if you're a major city, in your major city, you usually can find some parish that's at least tolerable and doesn't hurt your children if you're in a major city or, or even a medium city. But if you're in a small town, you know, rural setting or things like that, you know, there's no parish except this, you know, terrible priest who's abusing the sacrament 
publicly and preaching heresy. That's the only place for 50 miles or something like that. You know, mm -hmm. that's a very difficult situation. And when you're in a situation like that, it it's getting into that spiritual mindset of, of not leaving the church, accepting the suffering, doing what you can, praying to God for wisdom to guide you through that situation and thanking God that he has counted you worthy of suffering for his sake. Wow. What a wonderful answer. And you know, um, like my situation, my, uh, what I'm drawn to is, you know, incense and all that. And, but the parishes that are in my area, they say the black and do the red, the wonderful priests and, uh, wonderful community. And I know that that's what my wife loves and feels comfortable in and can grow and we can grow together. And, you know, there, there was a time before COVID when my daughters were like three and four years old. And after mass, we would go in front of the tabernacle, which was a beautiful tabernacle off to the side. And I would, I, I would say, let's say bye to Jesus. And my kids would, would do so. And then we'd leave. So, and what I would do, and I explained this in another uh, another of my videos, I said, what you can do where you're planted is be holy and dispose yourself. So I would do things like keep prayer hands through the, through the liturgy, minus the homily. I would receive kneeling and on the tongue, even though there was no altar rail. Uh, obviously, that I wouldn't cause a, a ruckus or trip somebody. But um, these kind of things you could do where you're, where you're planted and sort of the, the, the holiness, the disposition will be infectious and spread. And that's an example for your wife and kids. So, and Catholics have called me crazy for having this perspective. I, I don't feel called that I need to go to the Latin mass or whatever is, or a divine liturgy as beautiful as they are. I love all liturgies, you know, as for what they are, they're not always celebrated the greatest way, but all liturgies are beautiful. Our Lord condescends to each of them and makes himself present to feed us. So who are we to shun them and say, no, this isn't good enough for me. But at the same time, everybody does have their different spiritual paths and things that appeal to them. And, and somebody could grow in one place and not another. And that's fine. That's totally OK. Uh, but I think that's that's a perspective to have. Um, and I just wanted to touch briefly on something you said, uh, Tim. Dustin, you're cutting out again. I think we might lose Dustin again. I don't know. Um, but I, I think I'll just start talking it. Oh, uh, there we back. go. You're back. You're back. Go back. Ahead. <laughs> okay. I was going to say, you know, people people might respond to the whole, if you leave communion with Rome, you're outside the church. And uh, this is like some uh, medieval, high medieval papal invention of, you know, too much power associating Rome with the church as such. But I just want to read something from the formula of Hermistas in the 500s. Following, as we have said before, the apostolic see in all things and proclaiming all its decisions, we endorse and approve all the letters which Pope St. Leo wrote concerning the Christian religion. And so I hope I may deserve to be associated with you in the one communion which the apostolic see proclaims in which the whole true and perfect security of the Christian religion resides. I promise that from now on, those who are separated from the communion of the Catholic Church, that is, who are not in agreement with the apostolic see, will not have their names read during the sacred mysteries. So that tells you right there, communion with Rome is communion with the church. And this isn't something that was written in the 1400s or by a Borgia Pope. This is the formula of Hermistas in the 500s. So that's very patristic and ancient. Um, we do have a question from Eric. Eric says, personal thoughts on what parish, parishes could do better to attract converts to Rome instead of EO. We've kind of already touched on that, you know, solid catechesis, uh, solid liturgy. I mean, that, that goes without saying, right, pretty much. Um, yeah, it, I mean, it, yeah, I think it's it's very difficult. Yeah, I mean, you can't really make your comment, your average parish have a bunch of academic disputes about all this stuff but i mean it's mm -hmm. basically if, if the new the revised mass of paul the six the the so-called novus ordo is simply like you said if it's just celebrated by the book it's yeah. going to be accomplishing what you need um mm -hmm. just on a basic level 
I think, uh, but especially one of the biggest draws is, is the great aesthetic beauty of the Orthodox. And so mm -hmm. the higher you can make that mass celebrated, especially with the music, I think the music is one of the most conspicuous things about mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the revised mass. The, I think the easiest way to draw faithful away from this temptation is to have sacred music at the mass, whether that's the Latin mass or the revised mass, obviously the, the new Novus Ordo, having beautiful music as much as possible, I think is, is mm. a simple way to do that. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I mean, some of the hymns, my goodness, uh, <laughs> we don't have to go into detail, but, uh, I am sure everybody knows what we're talking about and can empathize. Um, but listen, man, uh, I want to thank you so much for your generous time and your wise words of wisdom and edification. Um, uh, Hopefully we could do this again and we could get into topics, specific topics such as, you know, is there a difference between original and ancestral sin? Why do Orthodox rail against the Immaculate Conception uh, and stuff like this? Maybe we could get into some more detail. Um, somebody just came in with a question, but I... Uh, I don't know. I don't want to. I don't want to eat up your time, man. If you oh, guys okay. jump into it, one last question. Go okay, ahead. this is it, guys. So I, I promise, this is it. Okay, so um, Azul Luza says on that topic: Would it be acceptable under canon law to attend an SSPX max mass when one of the surrounding parishes were severe liturgical abuses observed in practice? Yeah, I believe. I believe that is canonically allowed. You can elaborate on that too. Yeah, the, so the SSPX is officially permitted to attend by the Vatican, uh, and you don't even need actually you actually don't need to have a reason like that. There's a serious problem. You can actually attend the SSPX, and you can commune, and you can do everything that you would do at a Catholic church. You can even the one one the Ecclesia Day even said you can contribute to the communion plate. You can tithe mm -hmm. there. Uh, mm -hmm. This is all allowed officially by the Vatican, by the official channels that's already been decided. There is basically an irregular situation with the SSPX. And so this needs to be resolved because they are basically in the church. But there's sort of a, uh, especially among some of them, there's a wing of schism uh, mm. among some of, especially some of the SSPX. Some of like, I think one of their bishops especially is is very, very, reactionary and it's in his rhetoric um mm -hmm. so there's there's you know there's crazy people anywhere you go everywhere I mean, gonna, yeah yeah you're gonna get problems anywhere you go the 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 official vatican responses says says you can go to the sspx you can commune with no sin whatsoever you can just basically treat them like the catholic church except avoid a schismatic mentality Amen. so anybody mm -hmm. in the sspx who's you know, just railing against Pope Francis or just being really reactionary, really schismatic, that is something you need to avoid and avoid any pitfalls on that on that end. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that's the type of thing you need to avoid at a, an SSPX, SSPX chapel. But most of the SSPX chapels that I've that I've had any in contact with people, most of the SSPX people are just kind of normal faithful like you'd, you'd get at a normal parish anyways. So yeah. there, you, you're going to have crazies everywhere you go. You just got to watch out for the crazy liberals and the crazy reactionaries on both and, ends of that. So, and, that but yes. yeah. <laughs> and that's the thing. Orthodoxy is sometimes in the middle. And, you know, we don't like distinctions. We don't like nuance. We like extremes a lot of the time, right? Just our fallen nature. We want to just go here or there and be divisive. But if we walk that plank, that's often the place of safety, and it's it's hard to do a lot of the time. But even on Catholic Answers, you know, I've heard it said that, yes, you can attend an SSPX Mass, provided, just what Timothy said, don't imbibe, if there is a schismatic mentality at a certain chapel, do not imbibe it. If you want to go simply for the love of the traditional Latin Mass, you're free to go. Go for it. But just be discerning, be careful, just like you would anywhere else. Um, okay, so with that, uh, this was episode 28 of Holy Smokes, Cigars Catholicism. Let my prayer arise in thy sight as incense. I'm your host, Dustin Quick. This was my special 
guest and dear friend, Timothy S. Flanders. Make sure you check out Meaning of Catholic. He's got a website. He also has a YouTube channel. Uh, he's a great guy. Uh, love you to death, bro, for the sake of Christ. And I hope that you will come back on again. We can discuss more of these Catholic Orthodox issues in greater depth. And if you would, my brother, uh, why don't you lead us out in a prayer, and then I'll close the show. Sure. All right. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, guys, it's been a blast. Happy weekend. Stay safe out there. Uh, God bless, and we'll talk to you again soon. I'm going to end in three, two, one.